I'm Geoffrey Notkin, Meteorite Specialist, Science Writer, Adventurer and host of television's Meteorite Men and I'm here at one of my favourite places in the world, the Oscar Monig Meteorite Gallery in Fort Worth, Texas. And Oscar Monig was a giant in the world of meteorites. He was a, an amateur, an enthusiast who built one of the great meteorite collections and donated it to TCU here in Fort Worth. And so a really great mentor, hero to me, and an example of what a collector and someone with commercial interest in meteorites like myself can do to work with academia. He's been a, a, great, a great model and inspiration for me. I've been collecting meteorites all over the world for almost 30 years, and on June 22nd at Heritage Auctions, I'm auctioning my personal collection. And so I've invited my great friend Craig Kissick, who's the Director of Natural History, to meet me here at the Monig, and we're gonna look at some of the great meteorites here, and we're gonna see what their stories are and how they relate to our auction. What, what do you think? Look at that well, Texas I, meteorite I'm telling right there. you, we're in the Texas room. Well, welcome to Texas, Jeff. Welcome to Fort Worth. Thank you for sharing your collection with us and with the world. It's gonna be a phenomenal event this summer and thank you for coming to do this. So let's walk around here. Let's talk about some of the meteorites and we'll look at some of the cases and let's, uh, let's educate and entertain. So Craig, as you know, I am particularly fascinated by iron meteorites. Sure. There's something about, <laughs> the, about the density of them and the, the mm -hmm. remarkable shapes that they acquire traveling through the atmosphere. And that is my favorite. Sakodalim fell in eastern Siberia in February 1947 and we just happened to have a specimen here uh, of ours yes. that's, that's <laughs> in the auction. It's quite, it's, I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever taken meteorites to the museum before. I always go to the museum to, to look at them. So you can see the similarity. Look at the, look at the gorgeous yeah. surface features. So these indentations as you well know, were formed as the surface actually melted while it was hurtling through the atmosphere. And this one is particularly rare and amazing because it has a natural hole. And that's like, it. that's one in a thousand, if not I, more I would, rare, I would isn't say, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the number I've always used. Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm guesstimating, but if you think, well, how rare are meteorites to begin with? No, absolutely. One of, one of the most difficult challenging things to find on earth right. and then to see one with a natural hole yeah. is is right. especially a, a right. piece like that is about about as rare as it gets we know that when meteorites travel through the atmosphere they acquire fantastic shapes Absolutely. and, and are, are, are often uh, the, the remnants of their journey survives in the form of fusion crusts. Yes. So there's this, this dark rind that has been formed, a very thin and delicate rind that has been formed by the intense heat that mm -hmm. these meteorites are subjected to. But then what happens to them when they, they land on Earth, after they've been on Earth for a long time? And I know that you and I have both spent a lot of our <laughs> professional lives helping people who think they've found we, meteorites. We absolutely. So especially, this is partly my fault because of, I accept responsibility for this because of Meteorite Men, because we had a successful show that, that aired on all seven continents, has been seen by tens of millions of people. And so even if a small percentage of those people think that they, oh, I think I've <laughs> found one of those rocks that they had on Meteorite Men, that's thousands or tens of thousands of people who think that they found a meteorite. So this cabinet is for them. And this shows what happens to meteorites that have been on Earth for a long time. And uh, this is a great example, Gubara. We have a piece of Gubara in the, in the auction, and Haven from Kansas. So this was found in 1950, and there's a very interesting uh, conundrum with the names of, the, of meteorites and the way they were found. So every meteorite had to fall to yeah, earth right yeah, so you go well all meteorites are falls uh, but it's only called a fall if it was seen to fall when someone just finds a meteorite yeah. and didn't see it fall yes. it's called a find. find so that's the find fall conundrum right so this is a find it was found in 1950 in kansas but it has clearly been on the earth for a long long time and you can see traces of fusion crust, we call it remnant fusion crust, that has worn away. But look at the color. It's become a, 
an orangey bronze color, and that's, as you know, the iron oxidizing. So geologically, it's kind of an exfoliation that's happening. It's exactly yeah. what's happening on that. You can see how the outer layers have started to weather and sure. flake off. I think people are really amazed when we talk about things like Martian and lunar, where you can actually have a piece of the moon. Okay, and that brings us to a lunar meteorite. Now it's a completely different composition, but why don't you tell us what makes this so special and why this is such a classic lunar example, because I know it is. Okay, what, what, make, what makes this rock <laughs> so special? We've been looking at meteorites that arrived here in, in large part from the asteroid belt. We don't know exactly, in nearly all cases, we don't know the exact origin point of particular meteorites, but we do with this. And this slice that we're looking at is a piece of our own moon. Wow. Now, prior to 1969, there were lunar meteorites that had been found and they were, scientists were a bit confused. Well, these, they're obviously meteorites. They were either seen to fall or they, they were found in a fusion yes. crust. They're obviously meteorites. But when you cut open this meteorite and examine the inside, it's very different from the other meteorites that we look at. It doesn't have yeah. the same it's not made of the same materials. Oh. So what, what, what is this strange meteorite? Well, in, you, you will recall, although you were very young at the time, in <laughs> July 1969, Absolutely. Apollo 11 yep. lands on the moon, and Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin bring back the first lunar Sample. rock samples. Yep. Absolutely. And there's a very interesting historic connection between that time and our auction because Dr. Albert King, who was a NASA researcher, yeah. meteorite scientist, realized in the 1960s, during the birth of the Apollo program, that NASA was gonna have to do something with the moon rocks yeah. when they came out. What are we gonna do? <laughs> right. We don't know, are they gonna be radioactive? Are they, are, they right. gonna, are they gonna have contagions? They didn't know. So Dr. King came up with the idea for the lunar receiving lab, which, which was, was constructed to his, his design, and all the lunar specimens that then came back in, from the missions that followed went to the Lunar Receiving Lab, where they were studied. And Dr. King was a, an eminent meteorite scientist, sure. and we have some marvelous pieces from his collection in the auction, very important historic Absolutely. pieces. But, but to get back to this, once the Apollo astronauts brought back lunar samples and they were examined here on Earth in right. the Lunar Receiving Lab, Dr. King's uh, lab and elsewhere, they go, oh, these strange meteorites have the same composition as the moon rocks, <laughs> by and large, yep. that were brought back. And a yes. few lunar meteorites that we have are even thought to have originated near some of the Apollo landing sites, Apollo 16 in particular. So. If that's not the best argument that we have to uh, knock down these moon landing hoax conspiracy <laughs> people, I don't know what is. So we have, they're, they're very rare, they're very difficult to find. Yep. Lunar meteorites don't have the same high iron content that right. we find in most meteorites. Right. And so it, it takes a really expert eye to recognize them. But when you hold a piece of a lunar meteorite, you can go out in your garden at night with your lunar <laughs> meteorite and look at the moon and go, this comes from nice. there. And we can't do that with most other meteorites. No, we can't, and that's amazing. And I think like this is a classic feldspathic breccia to me, the way it looks, and it's, it's an iconic lunar. One thing I do want to clarify for people that may not know is that if, if an Apollo astronaut picked up a piece of the moon. We can't own that privately. That's the property of the government controlled by NASA. So why don't you explain how then do we have a piece of the moon? I mean, obviously it's a lunar meteorite, so why don't you explain how that can happen? Yes, well, I'm so, I'm so glad you brought that up. And, and, and as professionals in this business, we always have to be very careful to observe the regulations. Absolutely. And we, none of, the, none of the moon rocks in our auction are Apollo return Correct. samples, right. that would be illegal. Yes. The lunar meteorites that we have in the June 22nd auction are pieces of the moon that were blasted off by another meteorite <laughs> impact. So if you look at the moon, you look at a photograph of the moon or you look at the moon through a telescope, what do you see? Craters. Craters, yep. loads of craters. Yep. The moon doesn't have an atmosphere. <laughs> Our just... atmosphere protects us from yeah. most incoming meteorites and allows us to breathe, so we get a twofer <laughs> with that. If we didn't have an atmosphere, we would yeah. have meteorites falling all the time. Yeah. 
and we'd be out there in our spacesuits nice. probably getting hit by little ones. So anyway, kidding aside, well, it's true, but <laughs> I, I'm, I may be exaggerating a bit. Over the millennia, large rocks, probably from asteroids, yes. have hit the surface of the moon, forming those craters that we see, blasting pieces off. The moon has no atmosphere and less gravity than Earth. So it's easier for pieces to be ejected out into space. Sure. And some of those have been caught in Earth's gravity and yes. eventually fallen. And that's what that is. Yes. And because of its mineralogical content and its similarity to Apollo return samples, we know, we don't think, we yeah. know without a shadow of a doubt that those are moon rocks. Sure. And we can't own Apollo samples. No. We can't own one, it's illegal, but you can own a lunar meteorite. And we have some we have some smashing ones in the auction. Well, I mean, again, we? think about the origin and think about what it takes to get it. I mean, that the, the story, uh, it's a priceless object if you really think about well it. Well said. It really is. I mean, if you think about what it represents and, you know, every, I mean, what kid didn't look up at the moon and dream of magical mysteries and there it is right there for you.